Baghdad, November 22, 2003. Officially, the war in Iraq has been over for months, but the country is violent and unstable. No one feels safe. A civilian cargo plane has just taken off from the city's airport. What's that? Within seconds, the crew lose control, unable to figure out what has happened to their aircraft. We've lost all hydraulics. They struggle to master 100 tons of wide-bodied jet. Their plane is on fire. Unless they can land soon, the wing will burn up. They'll crash and die. Steady. They're carrying too much speed. They're going so fast, they may not make the runway. No one has ever successfully done this before. By November 2003, the American-led coalition has been in charge of Iraq for six months. The Iraqi army is defeated. Saddam Hussein, the deposed president, remains in hiding. Ominously, the main threat is now from secret armed groups. They're targeting civilians, both Iraqi and foreign, in order to make the country unstable, perhaps even provoke a civil war. They have plundered Iraqi army stores for every infantry weapon there is, even surface-to-air missiles. Baghdad is a very dangerous place. Dawn, on the outskirts of the city, Claudine Vernier-Pallier from the French weekly magazine Paris Match, with her photographer Jérôme, is going to a secret meeting with Iraqi terrorists. She's after the story that everyone wants. Who are they? What do they want? The previous day, she had met the leader in a hotel room. He called himself Abu Abdallah but no one knew his real name. <laughs> Evidently, this man was very, very determined to stop at nothing, to show the Americans that he wanted no more of them, at least not their military tactics. Baghdad airport, key to the US presence in Iraq. Military planes fly in daily to supply the troops and to help rebuild the shattered country. Because of the threat from Iraqi terrorists, the US has established a security zone around the airport, patrolled by Apache helicopters. On the tarmac today is one of the few civilian aircraft to use the airport, an Airbus A300, belonging to the courier firm DHL. They have won the contract to carry the soldiers' mail. They led us down little roads for a long time to be sure we would lose our bearings. At the hotel meeting, Claudine and her photographer had arranged to meet the rebels at dawn the next morning to take pictures of the fighters with their weapons. We arrived in a field where we met other vehicles, among them a pickup truck. The men got out of the cars. And just off the road, hidden under some branches, the men recovered some weapons and some missiles. They loaded their weapons in their vehicles, and Jérôme took the pictures we wanted. The journalists have got the story they came for, but Abu Abdallah is not finished with them yet. He tells them to follow. They don't know where. And he told me that a new phase in his resistance actions would be to shoot missiles at planes. A few kilometers away, the DHL plane is getting ready to depart. Two flights a day shuttle post and packages in and out of the war zone. Baghdad Tower, Oscar Oscar, Data Lima Lima, Airbus A300 cargo, April and information Sierra, Costa. The Australian Air Force is providing the air traffic control in Baghdad. Oscar, Oscar, Delta, Lima, Lima, clear to start. Before start checklist. Start two. 
Captain Eric Genot is Belgian, 38 years old and single. He realized his dearest ambition a year ago when he qualified to captain the Airbus A300. M245. Valve closed, EGT 610. Flight engineer Mario Raphael lives in Scotland with his wife and children. At 54, he's the oldest and most experienced member of the crew, a veteran of many danger zones. Start one. Valve open. The 29-year-old co-pilot, Steve Michielsen, is also Belgian. He's been married just three months. Cargo airlines are great places for young pilots to get the hours and experience they need to pilot commercial aircraft. DHL has been flying into Baghdad for six months. There's no danger money for crew. The airport is an oasis of calm in the middle of a chaotic war zone. Nevertheless, they're aware of what's going on around them. When we were crossing already the border from Kuwait to Iraq, the ambience in the cockpit already changed. You have a kind of stress, at least for me. The journalists have been taken to another location by the terrorists. By now, they're beginning to get uneasy. They'd like to leave, but they have no idea where they are and they feel that a dangerous situation will develop if they attempt to go. So, what's going on here? We're going to do special operations today. You'll see. I'll show you. This is Sam 7. We have them from the old Iraqi army. We have approximately 28. We got them from two different Iraqi army depots. We have already fired about 25, and we only have three left. They are heat-seeking missiles, equipped with homing devices which detect infrared emissions from a plane's engines. This Sam-14, better than Sam-7. We don't have so many. I think we should use this one today. It was very good before. We shot down a plane near Nasriya, and my fighters recorded 177 dead. And we shot down another plane with Americans on, and we killed 70 men. But no one had ever heard about this. I didn't believe a word of it. From all over Baghdad, you could have seen it. So I thought the guy was making it up. So what are you going to do with this one today? <laughs> what do you think? We're going to shoot down a plane. <laughs> I'll show you. The journalists are getting worried. What if he's not bluffing after all? This is not the story they came for. It's early in the day at Baghdad airport. A DHL Airbus A300 carrying letters home from US soldiers is just departing. The crew is unaware that just a few kilometers away, a terrorist group has its own plans for the aircraft. Oscar, Oscar, Delta, Lima, Lima, cleared for takeoff. Takeoff. The plane is a 24-year-old airliner converted to carry cargo. Its first stop will be the Persian Gulf state of Bahrain, it's a journey they make twice a day. 100 knots. V1. Rotate. V2. Positive climb. Despite the calm in the cockpit, the crew knows that below 3,000 meters, they're vulnerable to attack from the ground. So far, no plane in Iraq has been hit with a surface-to-air missile, but it's known that the terrorists now have such weapons. It's a strange ambience, it's a strange feeling. Between the time you take off and you reach 10,000 feet, you know that you are in danger. Gear up. Gear up, no lights. Meanwhile, the terrorist leader, Abu Abdallah, appears to have chosen his spot. 
He asked us to park our cars pointing outwards so that everybody could leave in a different direction. That's when I should have realized that the bluffing was over. The journalists are now very alarmed. They cannot leave. They're trapped. This is video shot by the terrorists themselves. They'll deliver it to the media in Baghdad the next day. three hydraulic systems. They are uh, identified by color, which one is the green and yellow and blue. Big jets depend on hydraulic power. Hydraulic fluid runs inside pipes throughout the aircraft. When the pilots move the control column, pistons push the fluid in the pipes to climb, descend, or turn the plane. With no hydraulics, pilots have no way to control their flight. The missile has exploded in the wing, where the pipes filled with hydraulic fluid are now draining. It's like driving a car at speed and suddenly losing the steering wheel. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What could I answer? What could I answer to him? It was a, a very, very difficult question he asked me. My initial reaction was, we have to do something. And I asked to the captain, like, what shall we do? Or, or any ideas or something, and he said, yeah. his initial reaction was, we have to go back. A big jet can survive with one of the three hydraulic systems knocked out, maybe even two, but all three? None of the controls will work, period. I think we hit something. Blue is gone. We've lost all hydraulics. All three hydraulic systems gone. There's nothing left. The life of the aircraft is now measured in minutes. That was the end of everything. Procedures, uh, what you've been trained all these years. and So all you needed then is uh, to keep calm, common sense, and of course, here where your experience comes, to, to see whatever is left there. But we had uh, nothing to, to come back to or read or do or follow. The control columns have become useless. Without the crucial hydraulic system, there's no way of moving the controls. When you have this kind of, of emergency, the tree needle showing zero, and the flight engineer saying you all hydraulic gone, you are terrified as well. It was fear. We had no control of the aircraft, of course, initially. 
The aircraft continued to climb at that time uh, until about 12,000 feet. The plane has started to behave strangely. It climbs to nearly 3,800 meters, then suddenly starts to dive of its own accord. Sink rate. Then it climbs again. Sink rate. Sink rate. It will not fly. Sink rate. Back, back. Sink rate. This cycle repeats itself over and over again, like a mad roller coaster ride. The crew can't stop the plane's wild gyrations. They're still airborne, but somehow they must regain control. And no, Eric, are you, are you proud of yourself? You look in which mess you are. You know it was dangerous to come here. And how you will, what you will do now to get out of here. I play with controls. I will reduce thrust. By moving the throttles to and fro, perhaps they can flatten out the huge dives and climbs. It's all they can think of. And then I decide to take the challenge. We have to come back. There is no training to fly a plane in this condition. So from that time and on, all the books and the procedures and this, they're out of the window. We have engines. We can use the thrust. All they have left are the two engines, which are undamaged. But how do you fly and land a plane with engines alone? No airliner has ever done it. Certainly not this one. In August 1985, a Japan Airlines Boeing 747 had suffered a catastrophe minutes after leaving Tokyo. The bulkhead at the back of the cabin burst open. The force of the rushing air blew off most of the tail fin and cut all the hydraulic lines. Without hydraulic power, the pilots of the 747 were little more than passengers themselves. A jet with 524 people on board, flying over the mountains of central Japan, was virtually helpless, swaying in the sky like a drunken bird. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics and their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains, and it became impossible for them to, uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all, uh, except to fly as long as they could and hope for some miracle, which never occurred. When the 747 hit a mountain, it was the worst single crash in aviation history. 520 people died. Can the DHL crew succeed where the Japanese pilots failed? The first task is to try to calm the wild plunging of the aircraft. The airplane will tend to go into what's called a fugoid in the vertical uh, mode. It will descend, speed up, therefore pick up more lift, then it would climb, pitch up and climb, it would slow down, lose lift, and so it would go into this and it was very difficult for the pilots to control that. They have to do it by using engine power alone, the only thing they have left. They find that if they reduce engine power, the plane's nose drops and they begin to gather speed. If they then push the throttles forward, the nose comes up and they start to climb but they have to learn precisely when to increase and decrease power. Main angle. Main angle. And there's another complication. The damage to the left wing is creating drag on that side and pulling them round to the left in a wide circle. One of the, of the most difficult things to master, to keep the pitch attitude in a normal way, was already difficult enough. And now, on top of this, we had to use asymmetrical thrust because the airplane was banking to the left all the time. There was a part of the left wing which was gone. Bank, bank. So they not only have to move the throttles back and forth to flatten out the plane's roller coaster motion, but also try to apply more power to the left engine to compensate for the damaged wing, which is causing it to lose lift. 
After several minutes of violent pitching up and down, the crew managed to flatten out the flight path. Even after we've learned how to, to fly it using the throttles, we still went through, uh, I would say three to four times, we went through un almost uncontrollable condition, you know, un couldn't control the aeroplane, like very steep dives and uh, banks. By now, the crew realize that they've been hit by a missile somewhere on the left wing. Their Airbus has become the first civilian aircraft casualty of the war. I knew we were on fire, that I knew it. So my intention was to come back and land the aircraft. And also, I was, we were afraid, I was afraid to be shot at a second time. Their fears are justified. The terrorist leader, Abu Abdullah, is waiting for a second chance to finish them off. Iraqi terrorists have fired a missile at a civilian plane near Baghdad airport. The left wing is on fire and the crew is in desperate trouble. Now the terrorists aim to finish it off. They launched a second missile that missed the plane this time. And then he told everyone, let's go. And we all left quickly. <laughs> Madame Vernier-Pallier later came under a storm of criticism for not doing more to stop the attack, or at least leave the scene. I think that any journalist in a situation we were in would have reacted exactly as we did. We have been criticized for not having said to the group leader when he told us he was going to fire on an aircraft, no sir, we're leaving now. On the one hand, if we had said that to him, it would have meant a bullet in the head, that's clear. And on the other hand, right up to the last minute, right up to the time when they fired a missile, I didn't think they were going to do it. I thought they were still bluffing. While we were trying to find our way back with our chauffeur, we saw that the plane, its left wing was on fire. It was now turning like this. It was like in a film, it was unreal. And it was only when we could see the plane on fire that we thought of the people on board. And then we were scared. I realized the plane could crash, that it would crash. And then I started to realize, why had they done this? It so happens we were there, we were filming, we were journalists, and we were French. So it seems evident that they had set us up. By the time we realized this, it was too late. Everything had gone too fast. The crew knows nothing of the second missile. Hey, Gramps, did you guys say there's an aircraft on fire? This remarkable video, seen here exclusively for the first time, was shot with the infrared heat-sensitive camera of a US Apache attack helicopter. Apaches routinely patrol the area around the airport, watching out for terrorists. Take time at 5-4, Tower. Roger, 5-4 is observing the uh, aircraft inbound under our sighting system. He's got, uh, appears to be a fire on his far left uh, engine. The intense heat of the fire on the Airbus shows up as a blur on the helicopter's heat-sensitive camera. There was a helicopter flying, and he could see that the fire was not from the engine, but it was from the left wing. So it gave Mario the opportunity to ask the tower again uh, if they could still see some flames or smoke coming from the airplane. Could you confirm if there's smoke coming from the aircraft or fire or anything like that? Tower Dragon Chamber 5-4. You can still see smoke and flame coming from the left tip. Of the left wing. Okay, left wing tip, uh, fire and smoke, huh? That's your problem. Thank you. We were on a, on a heading 
towards the airport. We could see the airport. Lower the gear. Can I take control? No, I have control. Lo I have control. Lower the gear. With no hydraulic power, Mario has to crank open the landing gear doors and let the wheels drop down by gravity alone. The captain said, in fact, we have to land. And he called for the gear down, which is quite a normal thing to go and land. But it has an unintended effect. Lowering the landing gear has altered the entire balance of the aircraft just when they thought they'd figured out how to control it. It causes the nose to point high in the air and the speed to fall. No, no, no the speed! It could easily stall and then crash. I didn't expect that at all and I saw the, the, the aircraft are taking a picture and then the speed decreasing, decreasing, decreasing and I was retarding the throttle and say no, no. No, no! It... The nose has gone up, their speed is falling, they're about to stall. They have no choice but to pull back the throttles to bring the nose back down again. They're nearly at stall speed. That would have been the end of it. We would have fallen out of the sky. You got a visual on the sky? No, I'm looking right into he's way out there. Yeah. That's gut wrenching, man. They're up there doing everything they can. I was afraid that maybe one wing we stole, and, and this time it's finished. I think I'd rather try to crash on a runway than crash into the desert. Yeah, and trying to land on a runway where you can just belly up in the desert, the yeah. of sand would probably put out any fire. Cautiously, they managed to coax a bit more speed from the engines. Lowering the gear brought them to the brink of disaster, but now the plane is easier to control. The airplane miraculously became more stable afterwards. That's one of the first factors which proves how lucky we were that day. Let's land. Tower, Delta Lima, Lima. Oscar, Oscar, Delta Lima, Lima, Baghdad Tower. Can you make approach now? Runway is clear for landing. The Apache helicopter has been joined by others who are powerless to do anything but provide information to the stricken DHL plane. It looks like you might be too high again. I'm still looking up at the flare. Come on, buddy. You could hear other aeroplanes talking at the same time. Oh, crap. And uh, that, on its own, uh, it was a bit difficult. Oscar, get down to Lima, Lima. Could you please... Uh... Oscar, Oscar, Delta, Lima, Lima, runway 33 left is available as well if you need to land there. Okay, keep both runways open for us. No more talking, bye. Tank 1 Alpha is empty. Fuel has been steadily streaming out of the tanks in the left wing. Bank now angle. one of them is empty. Back, back. Bank angle. Yes, got it. Bank angle. He's drowned. Left wing coming up. Against all the odds, they've made it back to the airport. An incredible feat of flying. They begin making preparations to land. Which runway? We use 3-3 three, three right, I think. Uh, Lima, Lima. Uh, Lima, Lima, go ahead. Could you please declare full emergency? Yes, we need the fire brigade because our landing gears might collapse as well. Oscar Lima, Lima, all available assistance is available on the field. Everyone is on full alert. OK, thank you very much, and, and no more calls. Uh, that guy's got to He's pretty stressed. Rightfully so. But on the brink of success, it begins to unravel. At that time, I realized that we were a, bit, a little bit too high to come in and land uh, in, that, in the situation we were. That's what I thought as well, we were too high and too near. We must land. We are too close, we need a land final. I mean, Steve brought a very important point here, and I think it was a, a really a saver. 
Steve is giving his captain news he doesn't want to hear. He can't land. They're too high and too close. If they attempt a steep descent, they'll bury it in the runway. Eric Janot will have to turn around, fly away from the airport for 37 kilometers, turn again, and come back on a long final approach, slowly descending. If we haven't done this 20 miles, we would have been circling there forever, and until we dropped to the sky or the wind. You can't make it, it's impossible. Keep the speed up, keep the speed up. I try, I, I will do the best I can. And then I, I realized they were right. We have to go on long final. But for the last 13 minutes, the wing has been on fire. Do they have enough time? 20 miles final. Okay. He looks like he's still pretty high. You got that side now? He's still got a long way to go. Though. Yeah. Well, it looks like he's turning like an extremely extended final. Yeah. And I don't think I can make it in. Time is running out. The fire is eating up the left wing. They're still heading away from the airport. Then they have to turn and make a 37 kilometer approach. Can they land before the wing fails? If for a mistake we stayed another 15 minutes in the air with that fire still burning, and maybe that tip of the wing would have broken off. And again, the results would have been disastrous. Two main structural spars give the wing its strength. The missile has made a five meter long crack in the rear spar. Too much stress and it will snap like a twig. There's another danger. Fuel is streaming out of the punctured tanks in the left wing. If the tanks run dry, an engine will stop and they'll crash. We were controlling the bank and the pitch of the aeroplane using the two engines. So if we had lost one engine, then we couldn't do anything with the other engine. So the end result would have been disastrous. Despite the fire, the crew's confidence is growing. Now they have some control over the plane, but the prospects for a safe landing are not good. This is the closest any commercial jet has got to a safe landing with no hydraulics. In 1989 in the United States, the crew of this United DC-10 lost all their controls after an engine blew up and turbine blades shredded the hydraulic pipes. The pilots managed to regain some control, moving the throttles backwards and forwards like the DHL crew. There were 296 people on board. But at the last minute, as they approached the small provincial airport of Sioux City in Iowa, disaster. Of the 296 people on board, 111 died. So within four years, two major airliners had crashed because a loss of hydraulics had crippled the planes, killing 631 people. In its investigation report on the Sioux City disaster, the US National Transportation Safety Board asked for urgent research to find ways of controlling big jets that had lost their hydraulics. But over Baghdad, 14 years later, the DHL crew only have their wits to help them as they try to land. I remember the story of the DC-10 of Sioux City, that it has been done before. The only control we still have on the aircraft in the cockpit was the engine. Nothing else. The crew are now 28 kilometers away from the airport, getting close to where they will turn in order to make their long final approach to the runway. 15.2. 16. Now we turn right. Not yet. This is where uh, experience counts now, and you have to rely on what you know. We were pretty sure that we were going to be able to make it to the airport, but we were absolutely not sure that we were going to be able to make it to the runway. 16.5. Now we turn. 17 miles. Now we turn. 
The only way they can turn is by applying more power to the left engine to make them go right and vice versa. They're swinging round to the right, trying to keep the plane steady and descend all at the same time using nothing but the engines. Airport's at 340, come right. Now 320. Speed. Turn nice and stable, keep speed up. Yes, yes. 1,000 feet. 2,500 feet. 2,200 feet. You turn on the head. Against all their instincts, they'll have to keep the speed up on landing or the nose will drop and they'll crash. They should be landing at around 300 kilometers per hour but they're coming in 100 kilometers per hour faster. No one knows if the landing gear will take the strain. As they reach 120 meters, the hot air from the ground and strong wind blowing across their flight path upset all their plans. The wind coming from the left and the turbulence, we were drifting to the right. That's where the airport building was. Bumpy. As the plane approaches the runway, the nose is pointing dangerously low and the left wing is dropping. Sink rate. Come on, buddy. They're carrying too much speed. They could overrun the runway. Sink rate. Sink rate. Keep the speed up. Sink we are going left. Yes, I increase. If we go to Iceland landing, may go up the runway. They are landing three, three left. Fire trucks on standby, medivac on standby. Bounce ahead, they'll be too wide now. Terrain. Steady. Terrain. Steady. Ah, you are approaching the end of your life. You realize it. Terrain. Pull. Terrain. Come on, buddy. 30. Back. Terrain. Okay. Pull. Terrain. 20. Pull. Terrain. 20. Oh. It looks like one of his gear collapsed. Yeah, it did. The DHL Airbus has managed to land through an incredible feat of flying. But their troubles are not over. Nice landing, well. Confirm, eva evacuate. Evacuate. Evacuation. Both I handle. Final irony, after getting safely to the ground against all the odds, one more unforeseen danger. Straight blow. Hey guys, don't move! That area has unexploded ordnance, do not move! What's that? You think there might be bombs here? I don't believe this. We're coming to get you! 
the area is still littered with unexploded bombs and shells left over from the battle to capture the airport from Saddam's men. Now we get to you, we're going to back up and you got to follow in our tracks. Now we're going to get you out of here. But you got to walk right in my wheel tracks, OK? Keep coming. Keep coming. It's not much further now. Now, for the first time, the crew can see the damage for themselves. They've survived the unsurvivable. No crew has ever successfully landed such a badly damaged airliner. They had to learn and practice a whole new flying technique. But the remarkable thing is, had they known it, the technology had already been invented to save any pilot in this desperate situation. The DHL pilots have managed to fly and land a plane without any flying controls. It's the first time it's happened. Two earlier occasions, near Tokyo and Sioux City, Iowa, ended with the loss of over 600 lives. In 1989, NASA began to investigate ways to land crippled aircraft using only throttle controls. Engineers and pilots came up with software that could cope with total hydraulic failure. It's called PCA, for Propulsion Controlled Aircraft. The PCA concept is simple. Pilots tell the aircraft's flight management computer what they want to do, turn, climb, descend. But instead of sending those commands down hydraulic lines to the control surfaces, the computer orders the engines alone to do it. To test this software, this MD-11 aircraft is landing with no hydraulics and using engine thrust alone. The pilot is not moving the throttles. The PCA software is doing it all for him. Though none of the plane's normal controls were used, the MD-11's landing was not only survivable, but very similar to a normal landing. I believe that the DHL uh, incident has revived interest in, in propulsion-controlled aircraft system as a, an augment to uh, perhaps the systems that we have uh, in today's aircraft that would, uh, would certainly mitigate the, the uh, damage that could, be, that could have been done uh, to this aircraft and certainly could mitigate the damage done to an aircraft carrying uh, five to six hundred people. One of the enthusiasts for the PCA system is Captain Denny Fitch, one of the pilots who survived the Sioux City DC-10 crash. This is just absolutely an amazing piece of equipment, what they have done and what they have achieved in the success ratio that we have, the survivability that we now have with modern aircraft completely controlled in hydraulics to have this occur again and have this aboard the aircraft is a very warm feeling as a pilot. Blue is gone. We've lost all hydraulics. America's Federal Aviation Administration conducted research into PCA, but soon abandoned it. It says the risk of losing all hydraulics is too low to make systems like PCA worthwhile. The FAA's conclusion after their studies was that these events are so rare as to not require the mandate of an additional system. And of course, they did not consider the event of, or the possibility of a surface to air weapons attack on the aircraft. The DHL is the first plane in Iraq to be hit by a surface to air missile. But in recent years, the threat of terrorist controlled shoulder launched anti aircraft missiles has been growing. There had been roughly 30-odd incidents of uh, commercial aircraft being attacked by manned portable surface-to-air missiles leading up to the DHL one. What makes the risk of missile attack in Iraq so serious is that for months nobody was guarding the abandoned depots of the Iraqi army, leaving terrorists free to help themselves to millions of dollars worth of arms. I believe there are weapon caches everywhere in Iraq. In my opinion, they also have many missiles. 
There's widespread fear these terror weapons could soon be targeting passenger airliners all over the world. The US government's Department of Homeland Security is spending over $100 million on research to adapt military counter-missile technology for civilian airliners. It, it is inevitable today that commercial aircraft will have to be fitted at some time with laser and infrared jamming systems. The infrared jammer will confuse the seeker for the a missile, whereas the laser jammer will direct a pulse into the seeker and burn out the seeker of the missile. Singapore Airlines, Qantas Airlines, they're all looking to install something into their aircraft. If you look at things like the Queen's flight in the UK, the President's uh, aircraft in the USA, and the King of Jordan's fleet, they're all fitted. Terrorism is with us today and will always be with us for the rest of our lives. It's impossible to defeat terrorism, but what is possible is to control terrorism at a commercially acceptable level. If we don't do that, then there's no future for us. But miraculously, without any of this equipment, the DHL crew had brought their plane to a successful landing. It's the only confirmed occasion in history when a missile has exploded on a large civilian airliner, which has then landed without crashing. For Mario Rofail, it was a good note on which to retire. It was a good timing, actually, to say goodbye yeah, to aviation. As I said, they've been flying for 30 years and um, clean record, even to the last minute. We were lucky, but also we worked. We, we fight to survive. I learned some things about, about life, maybe, but I don't think it makes me a better pilot. The three DHL crew have received some of the highest awards that the civilian aviation community has to offer in recognition of an unprecedented achievement. Teamwork was absolutely the key factor of uh, bringing the airplane back to the ground with all, speed, all three people alive. On December the 30th, 2003, five weeks after the missile struck the DHL airliner, US General Mark Kimmett gives his daily press briefing in Baghdad. Of note on Saturday, Sarhid Ab Sarhid a former directorate of military intelligence officer suspected of leading a large anti-coalition group in the region and suspected of the downing of the DHL jetliner, died at a coalition medical facility from wounds received in a targeted raid on his complex. The Americans believed they had killed the leader of the group that fired the missiles at the DHL. Claudine Vernier-Pallier is not so sure. So I thought he was dead. I tried to verify this later. He wasn't dead, and it wasn't him they got. And my photographer returned to Iraq and saw this person again. He was still alive. In the fog of war, no one can say for sure whether the man who called himself Abu Abdallah is still alive. But what is certain is that the threat of further missile attacks on planes, both military and civilian, is still there.